So because we're on retreat, I'm going to share with you Swami Ramananda's schema of what you do <laughs> when you're encountered with a problem. And he has them listed as follows. The steps to follow are remove, recognize, reflect, release, and replace, which is pretty good when you're on retreat. So let's think about these a little bit. Our first step is to try to remove ourselves from the situation. In other words, when you're confronted with a problem, it's a good idea to take a little time out. As I said, this could be taking a retreat. This might be sitting regularly for meditation. In certain cases, like when you're very angry, it can be a very good idea to physically remove yourself from the situation that seems to be provoking this response in you. And please remember when I say that, that it's not really the situation, it's your response that's the difficulty. So if you can, you actually back off from the situation. Now, if you're in a situation where you can't actually physically back off, you can also mentally back off. You can become the witness, removing yourself one step from feeling like you're the one involved in the circumstance. You can cut through your involvement on a physical level by taking a few deep breaths, repeating your mantra, saying a prayer. So these are a few different ways to actually remove yourself from the immediacy of whatever problem you seem to be perceiving. Now, when you remove yourself, you have the space to do something very useful. Step two is to recognize. When you're not totally involved and identified with the problematic situation, you are allowed the space to recognize what's really going on. You can recognize the feeling. Am I fearful? Am I angry? Am I depressed? You can start to recognize the circumstances that bring these incidences up for you. You may have a whole configuration of uh, dysfunctional cognitive structures or misplaced perceptions around some area of your life. It might be around money. It might be around food. It might be around work, right? That there's some area in your life where you have buttons that are really easy to push. When you start to recognize the patterns, it becomes much easier to take precautionary measures when you're dealing with those kind of circumstances and to go deeply into yourself to recognize the cause. What is it that tends to be bringing up this kind of a reaction in me. So what you want to do as this becomes clear, what the patterns are, what situations tend to bring them up, you want to start to reflect. Uh, recently someone asked Sri Gurudev, what do I do when I'm faced with the struggles of life? Should I meditate? And Gurudev answered, yes, you should meditate on the struggle. You should meditate on what is making you feel like this is a struggle. In other words, the problem can become your object of meditation. What am I doing in this situation that makes me see this as a problem? For example, if I am fearful, what am I fearful of? Fear, according to Sri Gurudev, is fear of loss. Any fear any fear whatsoever, if you really think about it, you're afraid of losing something. You might be afraid of losing your possessions. So you want to reflect on this. Now that you're removed, now that you've recognized that one of your patterns is that you're fearful of losing your possessions, you want to think about this. Well, what is this possession? Who was I before I had this diamond ring? Was I myself? Yes. Was I happy? Yes. I can remember plenty of happy moments. Then why am I now afraid of losing it? Well, because I'm attached. Aha! So you think this diamond ring is bringing you happiness. 
It's not the diamond ring that's bringing you happiness. Your happiness is already within you. You just see the reflection of it when you see it in the beauty of God in this beautiful diamond. So why don't you change your attitude toward it? Why don't you think that this diamond ring is actually God's natural beauty manifested in nature and that wearing it is a public service? Right? You're wearing this diamond ring as a public service because then anyone who sees it is inspired by the beauty of God's nature. When they see the light shining in it, they might remember the light in the eyes of someone they love very much. Remember the moment they got married and the joy and the happiness they felt at that moment, the love. So many wonderful things that you feel when you see something as beautiful, something as filled with God's light as a diamond. Therefore, I'm giving up this fear of loss. I'm going to stop hiding it when people are around, lest they take it away from me. And on the contrary, I'm just going to let it be out there in the world. God gave it. God can take it away at any moment. And if God takes it away, then my relationship with it has been one of pure joy. While it was with me, instead of holding on to it for me, I offered it to everybody in this world as a free gift of God's love. It was mine to share. Now it's someone else's to share. Very different perspective, right? So if you have that kind of feeling, that kind of feeling that objects aren't with you to make you happy. Objects are with you to make everyone happy. And since you're part of everyone, therefore you'll be happy too. So you develop a different kind of, if you reflect deeply, if you reflect deeply, you develop a very different fearless relationship with objects. And another thing to reflect on is what were you born with? You were born with nothing. And everything you have, God gave you or nature gave you in one way, shape, or form, including your body. When you were conceived, you were just two little cells, and your mother actually constructed your body with God's intervention. And when you leave, it's going to go back to the nature. The elements will go back to nature. So that brings us to the second fear, which is the fear of loss of our body. And we all will lose our body someday. It's pretty safe to say. Most of the people in this room are going to die. <laughs> uh, once Master Shivananda gave a satsang in Rishikesh, we're told, um, he used to come and sit at satsang and listen to others speak and be present. His being alone was darshan. And very often he would just come sit lead chanting and not actually speak. One night he said, I'm going to tell you four things to remember every day. And somebody got up and ran out of the room. And Master Shivananda said, where is he going? They said he's going to get um, Swami Venkateshananda. And that was because Venkateshananda used to edit his books. And he was out doing some service at that moment. And since Master Shivananda was speaking, they had to wait, run, get Ma uh, Swami Venkateshananda to take down dictation as he spoke. So Master Shivananda sat back in his chair. Swami Venkateshananda came in. He sat up and he said, I'm going to tell you four things to remember every day. <laughs> the first one is death. The second is God. The third is the pains and sorrows of this life. And the fourth is the pathway to God trod by the great saints and sages. The first is death, because death is the only thing, the only thing you're certain of. Everything else is pure hypothesis. Even that you'll be alive in one minute is pure hypothesis. Now, thinking of death does not make you morbid. On the contrary, the person who thinks they're going to live forever has time for gossiping, backbiting, hating, resentment, anger, and fear. But the person who knows absolutely that they are going to die, maybe this day itself, won't have time for those things. That person will be lively, cheerful, friendly, dynamic, and making use of every moment. The really intelligent person makes friends with death, sits death on his left shoulder, and when he has an important decision to make, consults with his friend, death. Hey, 
If I were to die today, how would I make this decision? <laughs> right? Such a person is not caught in petty, selfish motivation. Life takes on an entirely different meaning. The second thing to think of every day is God. Why? Because who do you think you are? <laughs> Where do you think this body came from? What do you think this whole adventure is about? What is the meaning of this life? The meaning of this life is an adventure, a play in the mind of God. We are all players. Play your part well. Thinking of God gives you an idea of the goal, gives you the purpose, tunes you in to higher wisdom. The third thing to think about is the pains and sorrows of life. Yes, meditate on the pains and sorrows of life. Again, this doesn't make you morbid. Meditating on the pains and sorrows of life makes you lively, gives you a keen desire to help those who are suffering, makes you compassionate. It dissolves the boundary between your ego and other people and makes you know that you are one when you see that all beings suffer, all of you share in sorrows. Your heart opens and you realize that you and that other are one in spirit. And remember the pathway to God trod by the great saints and sages. Why? Because the path to God isn't easy. It's the razor's edge. It's the hardest thing of all. If you remember the pathway to God, you won't waste your time in getting lost in the petty goals of life. You'll be up and doing in yogic sadhana. You'll be doing japa, pranayama, kirtan, and selfless service. Fasting, praying, eating lightly, keeping your mind on the goal. So those were the four things to remember every day. If you think about it, it's very interesting because every day you meditate on two of your biggest problems, death and suffering. <laughs> But meditating on them really releases you to live a fully happy, fully joyful, fully balanced life. When I can't go to sleep at night, I think of death. And I fall asleep like that. The mind doesn't like it very much. But if you, <laughs> you really try to imagine dying, if you really try to imagine dying, you usually relax very greatly because it feels so peaceful. Your breathing changes when you try to really imagine your physical form dying. Your problems fall into perspective, and as I say, the mind gets bored very fast and decides it would be more fun to sleep. <laughs> you might want to try it, but it does also give you some perspective on life and tend to direct your thinking toward the goal. So that's reflecting. You're reflecting on, you might say, the meaning. Fear is fear of loss. What about anger? Anger is usually based on desire. Anger is based on having a desire which somehow gets thwarted. You wanted things to be such and such a way. They didn't turn out that way. Now you're blaming someone else. Like in the instance of the young man with the dog. He wanted to impress her family. He opens the door. There's the dog. He runs away. Now he's blaming her for not telling him that she had a big, vicious dog, right? So our desires get thwarted. We feel encroached upon, and we have this large ego territory <laughs> that we're trying to protect, and the result is anger. There are many, many very good ways to deal with anger. One of them is to reflect on the results. Reflect on the consequences. This is one of the listings in the Yoga Sutras under Pratipaksha Bhavana. Pratipaksha Bhavana is the technique where you see a wave arising in the mind. A wave that you know from past experience is going to crash you upon the shore where you don't want to be. And so instead of riding that wave, you raise the opposing wave in the mind. So that if you're saying, I am a worthless person. You raise the thought, I am a child of God, right? Well, one of the techniques given in the Yoga Sutras is to reflect upon the consequences of whatever the course of action would be if you set out on a certain path. The path of anger has very, very serious consequences. First of all, 
you tend to hurt those you love the most. You tend to make enemies. People tend to flee you instead of want to be with you. You lose your influence. You lose your discrimination. In, in the Bhagavad Gita, they lead you through a whole chain of events. If you, you have a desire, the mind becomes attached to it, it gets thwarted, you get angry, you lose your reasoning. You can't see clearly when you're angry, can you? You really can't assist, assess a situation in an appropriate way. You lose your memory. You can't remember all the times you got angry in the past and it did you no good. And ultimately, you lose yourself. That is to say, you set out on a course of action that goes exactly counter to the best interests of this being. Anger, if you really meditate on the consequences, you would never pick it up, never give into it, flee it, shun it. So whenever you've been angry, the other person you hurt very badly when you're angry is your physical body, your physical body. You have adrenaline splashing into your system. You get all pumped up for fight or flight, and you don't run away, and you don't punch the person out, and it destroys your physical health. It leads to high blood pressure, heart problems, ulcers, lack of sleep, insomnia. Many, many, many physical problems are due to chronic anger. If you meditate on that, you would tend to leave anger alone. And the easiest way to really get beyond anger is to reduce the ego space. Reduce the space around you that you're trying to protect. Again, one of the great paths out, if you're really reflecting on the consequences to of anger and you want to raise the opposing wave, is to replace anger with love. That's the next <clears throat> re.